I went out there because I was like, I didn't have any ideas. So I was just like, what do I do? So I called up Andy. I go, hey, can I fly out there and sit at your place for, you know, for like a week? And he goes, yeah, so do you got anything written? I'm like, not really. I got a bunch of riffs. You know, so I went out there and I came back with like nine songs in a week. It's a whole other world. I mean, it's one road. As soon as you get into town, you're driving up and here comes this tractor, you know, and you can't turn anywhere. So you got to back up and kind of go into a pivot. Then when you pull up, it's just like kind of like a farm, you know, and you pull up and there's all these lambs and cows and goats, you know, off into the pastures. And that place was built in, I think it was like 1679 or something like that. So there's some ghosts in there in the one house that we stay in. And I mean, noises and sounds and just really spooky stuff. I mean, like one time when I was there, when I by myself, they put me in the big house. And at night, I mean, you can hear people like walking up the stairs and door shutting and you know I get up and look around there's no way that the door could have shut you know just so I mean there is that kind of stuff out there so just getting into the vibe you look outside it's all rainy and cloudy and but green everywhere and put on the guitar and shut. it's killer I love it I mean bands like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath you know, they used to rent castles and haunted houses and you know reading those autobiographies now it's like that's what I want to do. You know, I want to go somewhere else and write. I don't want to be in my house or I don't want to go to the studio to write at least. Over the course of putting this record together, it pretty much started with a couple demos that Eric had and we took it from there. Eric came in with his own riffs and went away to write them and get them sorted when he first went away. We talked though, he was just like, how's the sound? I was like, killer. But we wanted to <laughs> kind of come up with something yeah. instead of jumping in a rehearsal room going, okay, what do you got? What do you got? You know, I, I don't yeah. know. What do you got? I had a lot of stuff. He wanted to have come back and have something. Okay, here, guys, here's the starting point. Yeah. And that's how we kind of dove in. Alex came out a couple of different times, and we, you know, we spent, I don't know, I think a week one time and another, another week or so another time just, just working out different material. And a lot of it was actually put together by Eric and Alex just getting together. The last record, I had written like 99% of the, of the record and then I kind of made some demos and Alex flew out we learned them did our parts this record me and Alex were like I go man I just want to write like how we used to write we would go to his room and just riff out together you know no drums just to get parts down just ideas like we'd have a little library so we kind of did that we did that this time he'd fly out and we wouldn't see Chuck or anybody we would just be upstairs in, the, in our studio here and we'd go get coffee and get some baguettes and all the things we like to eat during the day, and just sit there and I'd play some, you know, that's cool. Or he'd play some, and I'd go, oh, I like that, you know. So this record, we really collaborated together. The guitar situation is very different from when we first started. Eric and I have both developed a lot as individual players, and I think we're able to make it work now better in some ways than we were. Eric's gotten so um, solid as a rhythm player, as a producer, and um, and as a lead player, too. He's just a lot more clear about what he does, so I'll still contribute some rhythms here and there, but mainly that's his role. He's contributing more solos, that's still more my main role. I think um, just after this much experience, I think it's a lot more solid. In the older days, we kind of were assigned, you're the rhythm guy, you're the lead guy. But guitar-wise, there, there was so much more boundaries to break down for me, you know, and for Alex, because I was the crunchy guy and he was, you know, the, the virtuoso. Now we're kind of sharing those roles, we're kind of playing off each other. You know, we've been doing this for a while now, so it's kind of just taking its time to where we're, you know, both playing those other roles, reversing them. It's 
really weird because when Alex left the band, that's when a lot of changes happened in weird. You know, I was starting to do a lot more solos, and um, he was kind of like felt oppressed because he couldn't play his jazz and do all the influences that he was into. And when he came back, he was, uh, I think he took a you know, big weight off his shoulders doing his other projects. And all of us now all got side projects, so it's a lot easier for us to focus on Testament and take those influences and put them in the band. This time around, we worked a lot of different places uh, putting this record together. Um, it kind of started off in um, Derbyshire with me demoing stuff up and then uh, coming back to here to our studio here at uh, Driftwood Studios with me and Alex working on stuff and then the whole band coming in and working and doing stuff. Chuck going to LA and working with this other writer that's been with us you know, since the, uh, the ritual. So he's kind of like a sixth member, Del James, really cool writer. In the past, I usually thought, you know, I write the lyrics, I write the pattern, that's my way and I'm gonna do it that way. This record, I really wanted to be the best record ever. I wanted to be produced, I wanted someone to push me a little more, challenge me a little more. And even on the writing of lyrics, I stepped out of the box that I've taken the challenge all myself. I used outside writers to try to write the best songs for this record. And I think that was the biggest change because we hadn't wrote records for, you know, The Gathering was in 99, and then the new record for formation in 2008. So our writing process had a big gap in there, you know. So from what we were used to back then to getting the original guys and putting it together now, I think where we're at now, the confidence of having the original guys back to, in the group, because it really does feel as if, you know, for some reason we're together and we're playing this and it's like we get to almost like finish something we started or see it to the end. In the older days, it was more of um, like a full-time process from the beginning to, to when it finished, you know? A lot of the stuff was much more rehearsed. Where here, it, it came together much quicker and kind of was put together and recorded a lot quicker. But that's what's gonna happen when you're a band that we just don't sit here and practice four days a week and sit down there and play for three, four hours a day, you know? It's tough, so when we get together, writing, rehearsing, everything, that's, that's the way it goes. You know, especially a band that's been around this long and everybody that's scattered. This is our home, though. This is where we kind of put everything together. Um, upstairs, we have a whole Pro Tool rig, and I mean, we could do a record here. And we have done records here. We did Demonic, First Strike Still Deadly, and we did The Gathering here, um, and we did our last record here, some of the stuff here. I did the first Dragonlord record here, and Chuck's done both of the DDP records here. So there's a lot of cool history here in a way. And it's just a rehearsal room, so it's kind of cool. When we were like at the stage of, okay, we're gonna do this record and who's gonna be the drummer? Eric put out some calls and I think Gene was the first guy to call back and say, I definitely would like to do it. And of course we've worked with Gene, and so we knew, okay, pretty much where we're going with Gene Hoagland when we were gonna write this and when he's gonna play on this. Uh, when Gene came into the picture, it all just fell into place. Gene Hoagland, I mean, what can I say? He's, you know, we worked with him in the past on uh, the Demonic record, and that was a lot of fun. Gene is kind of capable of playing anything on the drums. His whole attitude coming into it is just so pro, because he's like, whatever you want, I'll do. Whatever you ask, I'll try it. Over the course of my career, there's been a lot of bands where they're like, dude, you have free reign to do whatever you want. And I've worked with Eric before. We did the Demonic record back in, in 97 when that was released. And since I'd worked with Eric before, I knew that Eric is very exacting on what he's looking for. And I just want to help them, like especially Eric, attain his vision. If he's got a certain role that he wants, I want to hit that role for him. You know, I don't want to go off and say, well, no, I'm not feeling that. I want to put what I want in there. That, that just kind of bogs down the project. So I want to make sure that, that Eric and Chuck in Testament gets the exact vibe that they're looking for. And rather than having to arduously program it on a drum machine, you know, I just, I, I like being their drum machine. His timing is just like insane and his cymbal work and just the style of it. Like what Eric expects of a drummer, when Gene sits down and Eric's like, oh, that's it, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's true, you know, he just like, Slow it down a little bit here. Well, how much, you know, uh, one, one beat. Okay, so it's like he is like the atomic clock, you know, which they call him.
Eric's taught me a lot about playing drums, especially on the demonic era when I was a lot busier drummer back then. And Eric really taught me how to clip everything back, you know, just like, hey, don't play so many notes, you know, just really lay something super simple down. And so I tried to bring that into this latest one, Dark Roots of Earth, and just be very open-minded. When we wrote this stuff, I remember telling him I want, you know, the blast beat in this part or this real fast double days. He was like, you sure you want that? Because, you know, what if the guy that comes in can't play that? And I was just like, I don't care. I want a good record. <laughs> Oddly enough, after the record was done, I think Gene was kind of like, wow, this is really cool, man. I think I want to stick around. I've never heard him say that before. I mean, he's worked with us here and there, but, you know, he's kind of stuck around. You know, I knew what I was in for on this, and I was I was happy to do it. You know, I was stoked, and, and you know, I just tried to, to perform the best I could and give Testament the exact drums that they're looking for, and I think we did. That's what's kind of fun about working with Testament. I got Chuck telling me, do a bunch of Gene stuff. And I got Eric going, you got to do what I'm trying to tell you. You know, so it, it made, I'm like, hey, you guys talk. You guys figure it out. Dark Roots of Earth is, it's kind of fantasy based, but it's kind of based on um, just the whole prophecy of kind of like the end of the world. The aftermath of how we always go back to nature. The whole concept of the album is, is based on that. There's a few things we can't get away from. I forget who said it, but you know, like death and taxes are the only sure things in life. Another thing that is sure is that, you know, is the, is the earth. We're all going to end up back in the earth and it's just an interesting thing to think about it gives you a different perspective and hopefully uh, you know gives you an, an appreciation and respect for for the planet but it made a perfect concept for this album the whole album cover is kind of the forest god vibe it's kind of like a celtic god that whole vision of, of the album cover we're like trying to think like you know fantasy but reality our world is changing it has changed over the last 10 years the environment, uh, seasons, just everything has changed. It's hard not to see what's going on and what the media is feeding us, you know. Then the world's like a big billboard. It's really like an advertisement and I think um, a lot of people believe in it. Maybe there's something to it, something might happen. Now that the sun won't shine, slow down and take your time. True American Hate, for me, was inspired by... I have a, a vision burned in like the back of my head about seeing young kids burning American flags, like on the news I was seeing, and, and you see their parents right along with them, you know, roaring them on. And to me, I, I, in my lifetime, I'd be like, wow, how's that person gonna be grown up hating such a society of America and Americans? Was to me, it was real heavy. Like, what is it going to be like for like my grandchildren, my children, years to come? You know, in a society that's just it was so much hate, and that that was just burning in my head. How they see how we're better off than the world, or we always seem to come to the rescue for the world, but yet there's so much hatred for it. came up with the idea of Native, but I knew I didn't want to just make it focused on Native American. I wanted to be Native whatever, kind of the indigenous people. And that's the vision I had, especially if like seeing a video, I've seen like all these different tribal leaders and all these people gathering together to like voice their words, stepping up and having something to say in today's times. We decided also to uh, do a song in Spanish. Um, we, we play South America a lot lately. We've been playing there and we have some great fans down there. Mexico. And, uh, Mexico and you know, Argentina and 
Chile and everywhere down there. So we always talked about it, you know, like how cool would it be to have a song in Spanish. <laughs> When we wrote Native Blood, I knew right away that'd be the, definitely the song that would have to be the one that I'd do in Spanish. The way the interpretation went, we didn't say Sangre Nativa, it was Sangre Indígena, which is indigenous people, meaning more than just native. Yeah, it took a while to do it, but yeah, I think once he got it. Yeah, there's a few words, the parer, you know. Fuera! Fuera! Fuera te pasó! It was challenging, but, you know, it was, uh, now I didn't even inspire him. I guess I'm going to have to go learn Spanish now and uh, really, really do it. Bien, muy bien. Well, Andy Sneep, I think his role with us and we, why we we keep sticking with him, is he's our age, and he comes from a band called Sabbat, which is close to the the genre that we were at when we first started. But they, you know, from England, you know, he's a fan of metal and he plays guitar. That's another thing, is to have a producer that's actually a musician. Andy's kind of comes from our background, so he he gets it what we want to do. You know, the, the pinching of a chord or just certain little things that other people don't get. For me, just working with them, I, it's like he's in the band, and he cares about the music like we do. And I think he doesn't just work with any band. He's kind of got the bands that he likes to work with. This Marlo. is one of the min many minions that work for me. So here we are, we're gonna try a bit of my first chili. You know, gonna air it, you can have, uh, have that bit, I'll have a bigger bit. Oh. 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 Having Andy Sneap manning the helm, he was really good on reining everything in and, and getting getting the good vibe, and getting everything going. Andy's great to work with. He has he has a really good ear. He's um, how do I put it? He's real critical of me um, bending notes out of tune, which I think that. If you really listen to some of my earlier stuff, there's a lot more of that going on than, uh, than you know, I'd probably like to admit. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's all really subtle, it's all really slight. Just Andy has a really, a really picky ear for, um, for tune. But yeah, overall he was really easy to work with. It was real quick. It was a pretty painless process. It's a very rainy Sunday here in New York, and um, today I will be tracking for uh, the song Power Slave, originally done by Iron Maiden, and uh, this is one of our bonus tracks. I'm really uh, excited about these covers. They came up kind of last minute. I guess the idea had been tossed around, but sort of placed on the back burner, and uh, we hadn't really been aware of it until after we'd finished tracking for the album. So a bunch of songs were tossed around, and um, I'm really pleased with the ones that we ended up doing. We all sent emails out saying, okay, everybody throw a couple ideas, let's see what everybody's thinking, but what I really wanted to kind of go for was grab a song that was familiar, but wasn't really necessarily had like heavy guitars or anything, just had a melody and a, and a rhythm, and then let's make that a testament song. Go! The Queen song came up, Dragon Attack, and after hearing I thought vocally I could hear it, me doing that, and musically, I was thinking, okay, well, we're gonna change it from make a testament, get rid of the bass, and let's take it over with the guitar. The original Queen song is kind of in like that early 80s classic rock radio vibe of like say a, a Billy Squire, The Stroke, and 
Eric and I were having kind of a hard time wrapping our minds around it. Like, what are we going to do to this thing to kind of like make it cool? And when Chuck brought in his ideas, his ideas were so clear and concise that Eric was able to go, I know exactly what you're talking about. Let's take this route with it. When I heard the song, I was just like, but then he came there and he goes, think like ministry. Yeah, what would ministry what do ministry to this song? Do you know? So I was <laughs> like, right away, the beat changed everything in my head. I'm like, oh. Chuck had the idea to really just like go way off the arrangement. He had a great idea, Eric put some great ideas out, and I just tried to do what I could to, to make it all really killer. Well, the Scorpions tune for me, I thought, was definitely when I heard it just the, for the first time, tuned down, I was like, wow, okay, all right, here we go. And I wasn't quite as sure how I was gonna attack it once I got in the mood and really just let it flow. It just came natural and just this dark, heavy, Thing that sucks you in and just you know get you. I really dig how it's come out. I think it's got some psychedelic qualities. It's got some industrial qualities, kind of like the Queen tune in a way. Like I, th I think both of those have potential to cross over, which is totally unintentional. It just um, the tunes just seem to have happened naturally. That song in particular, um, I, th I think when I suggested it, it was like it was like the other ones. Like when he suggested Dragon Attack, I just could not picture it. But he had a vision of like how we were going to play it, and the same thing with, with for me with Animal. I knew I was going to tune it down real low and just make it like Frankenstein or you know something crazy like that. I know Juan was saying uh, when Chuck was recording it, he was like. I'm not going to say make love to me. I'm not going to say make love. No, I'm not doing it. <laughs> he had to like talk him into it or something. So, no, I didn't do it the whole <laughs> track. I, every chorus I sang, I didn't say it. I don't want to say make love. So then the last <laughs> time we go, okay, we sure we got everything? We're like, okay, well, let's go to this last chorus over here one more time. And that one I said make. And he like, <laughs> you know, and the power of Pro Tools, you know, I think, you know, now they say make. So, you know. It came out good. I though. didn't say it. Really, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> You have a song like Power Slave by Iron Maiden that we did a relatively true cover of, and Chuck sounds like Chuck. You know, he doesn't try to sound like Bruce Dickinson, and Chuck sounds like Chuck Billy, and it sounds killer. And musically, I tried to emulate Nico as, as best as I could, uh, except I used a lot of more double bass, which is what I do. I'm not gonna approach Steve Harris's stuff without respect. You know what I mean? It's just, that's, for, for a bass player, I will treat his material with respect. The one thing that really scared me at first was when I listened to Power Slave. Like in all the years I've played, I never really sat and figured out other, other people's songs, you know? I probably couldn't play five covers all the way through. At first I was just like, wow, that, there's no way, I'm not going to be able to learn all this stuff. And, but you know, once I started to break it down and figured out, oh, okay, that's what he's doing here, okay, that's what he's doing here, it's like it, it all came together. I was wondering what could we possibly do with an Iron Maiden tune, but it, it actually really sounds... Um, updated and it sounds like our version of the tin. The whole thing about doing covers um, successfully is taking the song and making it your own to where you go, wow, that's different, you know. And I think we achieved that with Dragon Attack and animal but I think Power Slave we were kind of selfish and just put it on there because or for me I'm just a big fan of it and of course Maiden's version is you know we kind of kept it like that I mean you can't really take that song and do anything different with it it is what it is Come on now, Santa Claire, get on the We've been around for 25 years, man. It's hard to believe. Um, you know, 25 years ago, if, if I said to myself, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in my four, you know late 40s, I would picture me, I don't know, maybe in a band still, but not playing heavier than what we're doing now. You know, I mean, I think we're kind of playing how I wanted to play back then, and it's cool because like. 25 years ago, our style is kind of still the same. You know, it isn't like, and it's not out of style. If you'd have told me 25 years ago that I would still be doing this, I'd have laughed in your face. But you know what? Here I am.
I don't know, it's almost surreal that it's been 25 years. Twenty-five years, it feels strange. I'm sure the other guys have a very different take on it, because um, I was actually away about half that time. Because it doesn't feel like that long. You know, Twenty-five years um, seems like a long time, especially back then. Most of the band was not yet 25. When I joined, I was still in high school. For most of us to have been younger than the amount of time that the band has now been around, <laughs> It's a little bizarre. There's been a lot of low lows and highs. Um, the highs were getting signed. You know, and being just a you know a local band playing Ruthie's in and just having kind of a following in the Bay Area, to getting a record out and then going out with a band like Anthrax, which is a band that we love. You know that they're already touring the world and like wow, we want to do that. And then them taking us on tour and bringing us up to Europe, and we actually got pretty lucky. Our first three or four records, we just kept making records and touring, and touring. <laughs> A lot of bands it takes two or three albums for you to finally have that breakthrough record. Testament's first album was a breakthrough record, it was a strong thrash record and so they gained an instant following due to the quality of their music and then they were able to attain that for a long time. But then you know reality starts setting in and so we've always kind of been the band that's been kind of like in purgatory. you know. <laughs> We're never like too small, but we're ne we were never really big. You know, now I think we're just, we're kind of fine in purgatory. That's kind of our, our road in a good way. Looking just now through over the years, I think moving forward, the highlights definitely all of us kind of joining together again. We never thought it was going to be the reunion and then I think the one show was like five shows turned into ten shows and then bam here we are today. We're all in a good place right now and I think it shows in where we're at in our writing with it at this point in 25 years. You know there's a lot more confidence in the writing and the performance. be able to get together and come up with a collection of music and perform the earlier music as well as the current music and have it resonate with uh, both the uh, members of the audience that was there the first time around and this whole new younger audience that, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. We've gone through the test of time and we're still here, so, I mean, 25 years later, we're playing heavier than we've ever played. That's kind of the beauty of testing.